It's time to pull those belts tight, race fans. The Front Stretch is coming at you. Presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Now, here's Dan Taylor and Dirk Houston. Well, good morning to you, race fans, and welcome to The Front Stretch. Presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Online at joeskarting.com. By the way, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. It's It's been a good holiday season. I think I've enjoyed it thoroughly. The bitter cold that hit the uh, our area the last week and a half has definitely put a damper on my mood. But The best, the best part I enjoy about Christmas is the uh, tale of the three wise men because actually there were four. Oh, yeah? But the fourth one got turned around because he brought a fruitcake. <laughs> I don't know if I can air that one. <laughs> That might, have to, that might have to make the internet only cut. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say a big thank you to Joe Carding for sponsoring the show again. It's our final show of 2016, Dirk. Can you believe it? Well, yeah, just barely, though, by about eight hours. Yeah, uh, we, um, we have had uh, quite the interviews uh, this year, including uh, Scott Bloomquist, who we'll talk to again today, uh, Alex Bowman, Chris Busher, Rico Abreu, uh, help me, uh, Bobby Pierce. Uh, oh. I think next year we're going to try to get Bobby on. Pierce's sister on the show. Yeah, there you Jeez. go. I mean, yeah, but we'll have to do video for that one. <laughs> we had, uh, I mean, we had Carl Edwards, yeah, um, Landon Castle, uh, a lot of Chris Busher, uh, as well as track information. You know, being down at the Silver Dollar Nationals and Dave the, to Spain, Dave yeah. Star. Dave was a great interview. That was that was some great insight from the Mav TV guys. Hey, by the way, the Mav TV guys have the uh, Chili Bowl coverage. Which will happen, be happening, um, from what I understand, the RacingBoys.com has the coverage Tuesday through Friday. And then Saturday's feature action will be broadcast on MAV TV. So they have the broadcast rights for the feature event. So if you happen to have MAV TV through your cable provider, you can grab it and you can watch the, uh, the Chili Bowl, the 2017 Chili Bowl. We'll see if Rico can go three in a row. And uh, if you don't have Mav TV, like I'm a Dish pro- subscriber, so I don't get Mav TV, and then uh, so I'm going to be down to Quaker Steak and Loot. We're working on a deal with Chris to uh, to put the race on. Hopefully, he'll be able to come through with us on that. The only thing that could get in the way is I believe that is Divisional Sunday for uh, the NFL, and we all know the NFL takes precedence over a lot of things when it comes to playoff time. So we're, we're working out a deal with Quaker State to try to get that brickyard again like we do with the Homestead, and we're going to do a Chili Bowl viewing party and watch uh, hopefully watch Rico go three in a row or see who else can uh, try to win that race. So that'll be a cool event. If you want to come down to Quaker State and Lube, I think that kicks off. We're going to try kicking things off about 6.30, and then uh, racing action should kick off about 7.30. But uh, I want to say a big thank you to everybody for all their support this year, especially you fans. We've got some big stuff coming in 2017 that's uh, still, I know we've been talking about it for a couple of weeks, still in the works, but we're getting there. It's slow, and, and now now we're just dealing with everyone's on vacation, so it's and, hard to get anything done. And hopefully a continuation of the prizes and everything that we had last year. Yeah, absolutely. All the prizes have gone out for the Front Stretch Pickups Contest, so if uh, if you're listening and you haven't got your, your Pickups Contest prize yet, you might want to get a hold of me because they should have all been mailed out and they should all be at your house by now. Uh, I know today's Sunday, but they should have been delivered well well in advance. So thank you to everybody who participated in that. And uh, sounds like we might be going to an online uh, source in 2018. 20, 2017, we're still going to run it through. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that because I have till February and, and they should be getting the new that, that website that I was checking out. They should have those up ready for me to try to see how that'll work. But um You'll have plenty of opportunities if you want to get involved in the Pickums contest to do that either online or through email, however we do that. Really, let's talk about the news and notes for today. Actually, the preview for today's show, we're going to talk a little bit about the NASCAR news and notes. There's not a lot that's going on right now. Well, I did notice yesterday I saw a post uh, on Facebook that uh, does show NASCAR's new logo. And basically what they did, if anybody hasn't seen it yet, is the bars in front of the word NASCAR, they made color, and then the word NASCAR is just in white. It looks a lot like the 90s NASCAR logo. Well, up through 2016, right. except for the color part of it. Okay. See, and that use, whenever I picture, like, just the NASCAR standalone, yeah, that's normal, but, like, the, the Cup Series logo, when they had it in the Sprint Cup Series, it it was a part of Sprint's logo. Right. And so it was, it was kind of... It, I had a lot of discussions with Chris Krug about this because he he didn't really feel like it was the greatest of all logos. And and I'm like, hey, listen, nobody's going to be completely satisfied with a logo. But this is NASCAR and Monster bringing their brands together. This isn't NASCAR adapting to the title sponsor's brand or Monster adapting to NASCAR's brand. 
two separate entities coming together for one sponsor for one logo and and it's i think it's fine i think it's simple i kind of like the new nascar logo it's it's just like it, they updated the, the font on the nascar a little bit hey. and, and the coloring of it too yeah i mean it just uh they went back to ground zero and mm-hmm. started over you know so it like you said it's not a con- uh a collaboration between the two. It's totally new. Yeah. Uh, in turn two, we're going to talk about uh, Stuart Haas Racing. We'll put the team spotlight on the uh, former Chevy drivers, soon to be Ford drivers in 2017. And then in turns three and four, the Legends of the Dirt Series will continue. One of my favorites, Scott Bloomquist. Always entertaining to talk to. Always has something to say. We're expecting it to go somewhere around three and a half hours, but we only have an hour show. So uh, if the... Check out the YouTube video broadcast because the last couple of weeks we've gone pretty long in our shows. And so those broadcasts have had all the content that we've talked about where we've had to cut a lot of it out on air. You know, about five, six minutes worth of conversation just because we had to have time to fit in with our little hour window. So if you ever want to catch the – if you ever think, well, that sounds like that wasn't a – Sounds was like they dropped a, something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go back and listen to the online one. That's where we can have Jer- Dirk's dirty jokes <laughs> <laughs> and my slip ups and stuff like that. So, but yeah, back the to the uh, version. back to the NASCAR <laughs> logo. Uh, it's you know, it, I think it's going to be cool. There's surprisingly a lot of people out there that are upset by this sponsorship, and it's yeah. By the way, you can't see it, but Dirk just rolled his eyes about as much as a guy can. Well, it's what I was ridiculous. upset about, what I was upset about, was the amount of money that I heard the sponsorship was worth. Because I know the Sprint deal. Because I mean, I was still a part of NASCAR when all that mm-hmm. came through. I mean, that was a ten year deal. For seven hundred and fifty million dollars, that's seventy-five million a year. Yeah, and I haven't heard the terms or the length of the monster deal, but I only heard it was twenty million bucks. Yeah, I, I heard it was two years with an option to continue. So I don't know if it's twenty million a year, which is still a far cry from seventy-five, or if it's twenty for two years, which is even a further cry. Mm-hmm. But yeah, evidently, I mean the uh, the advertisers, I mean the uh, corporate is noticing the drop in attendance and everything else at NASCAR events. I mm-hmm. mean, everybody knows NASCAR people are very loyal to their brands. I mean, I know people that still buy Tide detergent just because they used to sponsor Daryl Waltrip and Ricky yeah. Rudd. You know, um, a lot of people drink Coke just because it's the official drink of NASCAR, the same with uh, Bud, Budweiser beer and Bush Light beer and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, the corporate people are noticing yeah, and it's I. We're going to have a lot of discussions about this in January and February as we get ready for the season. I, I the last week and a half with, with all of this monster announcement, there being the title sponsorship, it's been a little over a week and a half. Uh, but all this stuff that's been coming out, I've done a lot of thinking about this, like the state of NASCAR, and I don't think it's near as bad as anyone as people will talk about. Well, no, it's not as bad because once it when it really gets bad, you'll see them drop a race here and there. You know, the schedule will shorten up. Because the teams will say, we don't have enough money to run 36 races. We've seen this before with NASCAR, even during its prime, where there was racetracks, North Wilkesboro, that they lost their race because they couldn't sell the track. And so NASCAR said, well, if you can't sell tickets, you're not able to pay the sanctioning fees, you're not able to pay the purse, we're going to have to go to a track that's selling right now. And this is another reason why we have so many mile-and-a-half tracks, because they were selling 70, 80,000, 80, 90,000 tickets, and they were easily able to make up the purse. Now the sports shrunk a little bit, and, and now they're, they're selling 60,000, 50,000 t- tickets for two races. And, uh, and, but, you know, I, I look at the state of the other sports. NFL's having issues with, with ratings. NCAA football's having issues with ratings. Basketball, baseball, every sport out there is having an issue with ratings. And I don't hear anybody saying, well, sports have gone wrong in these days. It's, you know, it's simply the nature that we're in. Ten years ago, the internet was hard, was, wasn't was near what it is today. Social media has completely changed our society, our, the way we intake things, and, and the, time, the time that we have for stuff. I relish the, that week that I go down and hide in Mexico on a beach for a week because I don't have my phone on me. I don't look at Facebook. I don't look at news stories. I don't look at anything. I sit on the beach and I enjoy myself for that week. Well, I can tell you we relish that too, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> silence. But another thing this particular year with the election, the election was so concentrated and so thick in the news mm-hmm. with the, with all the 
I, I'm going to use the word fighting, even though it wasn't physical fighting, but I mean. It was as close as it will get to physical fighting. Yeah, it, well, and in some places there was physical fighting. But I mean, yeah. that was such a big part of the news. A lot of people that I know, me included, I left the TV off a lot more than yeah. normal. I mean, I, I've hardly watched any football. I've watched college games and I go to Nebraska games. Mm -hmm. But uh, pro games, uh, I bet I haven't watched a total of a whole game this season in pro football. Yeah, I definitely haven't. I definitely have not. And I haven't watched. Uh, I watched the Iowa-Nebraska game up until halftime when I realized that Iowa was probably going to end up winning that game. Well, like but that me. was it, you know. It, I, but I just, it's oh, absolutely. Come on now. We watched part of that uh, North Dakota State-Iowa game in our motel room over in <laughs> yeah, and that's when I started drinking heavier. <laughs> well, we did go to the bar after that. <laughs> but, you know, it's I don't watch – I've I've completely stopped watching basketball. Baseball, last year's World Series was – what? That was a five-game World Series. And so I may have watched seven total baseball games last year. And it was all a six-game six World okay, Series. Okay, so but... I watched the World Series – I watched all the games of the World Series, plus I watched a couple of them because I went down to Kansas City and, and watched the Royals play. Uh, but that's it. Of the, what, 160-some games that each team plays, I, I watched seven total, eight total. And it's, it's just – I don't watch near as many sports. Now, I catch – I probably watch 30 – two or 33 NASCAR races. There's some of them that just because of life gets in the way, I'm not able to watch them. But then I go back and try to catch the highlights so I can be on the show and we can talk with a little bit of an opinion. But well, you make me watch it. Right, yeah. That's, <laughs> I appreciate that. Like when I'm at I-80 for a Saturday night race and I can't watch the dirt race and the NASCAR race at the same time. It just doesn't work out. But yeah, so it's, you know, I, I don't think there's so much of a problem as the state of NASCAR. It's just that that there are so many opportunities out there even more than just sports. I mean, there's 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 just things out there that everyone does. You're so busy with your life that I think that sports is now starting to t go to the back burner for a lot of people. There was a long time there when it when everything was about sports. That was the biggest sponsorship was was a, a stadium of an of an NFL team, and now not a lot of NFL teams have title stadium sponsorships anymore. Yeah, that's correct. I, it like I said, a lot of it is is. Just the the corporate dollar. I mean, I I don't understand how they keep saying the economy is so great and everything's going on, and everything that I pay attention to is going backwards. Well, and I'm we're going to get it. That's a that's you know a conversation you and I have had a long time. My life has certainly got better over the last ten years. I mean, I that that hurt in the world of a salesperson in two thousand eight, and that was a pretty stressful five six years. But as a salesperson talking to a lot of my clients. Business is definitely turning around. I, I've never heard anybody say the economy's great, but they've I've heard them all say it's better than it has been. That the the numbers have recovered since 2008. We're still in a tough spot. We're never going to be 100 percent again. I mean the 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 20s and the in the 80s that we had such big booms. Probably never going to happen again. It's just not the nature of the world anymore. But, you know, I digress. This is, we'll talk a little bit more NASCAR here. But, <laughs> you know, and, and to talk about some of the some of the sponsorships, Target announced that they're reducing their sponsorship with Kyle Larson and that 42 team at Chip Ganassi. That's kind of surprising to see that with – Kyle is one of those guys that gets reported on regardless of how he finishes. You know, he's, he's kind of got that Dale Earnhardt Jr. a little bit. Well, he's making the news during the race by bouncing off the wall or yeah. doing something, even if he's in 25th. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you've seen Target's news and their stocks dropping and everything else. I mean, it's a bunch of that bathroom gender stuff that's still dragging around for them, and people I don't, are... I, I, I believe don't, it. I, I, I can't believe that at all. Honestly, to be honest with you, when somebody referenced that a while ago, I was like, that's still a thing? I mean, this was like two weeks ago. A, a crazy friend of mine on when, Facebook mentioned it, and he's like, I'd never go to Target because of that trend. Or th well, what does it matter? I mean, honestly. Don't I, go to the bathroom at Target. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I've gone to – I mean, I used to shop at Target. Uh, Amazon.com is the reason why I have stopped shopping at Target is because I can find things for half the price on Amazon, and they could be at my house in two days. Yeah. I mean, that's that's – I think that's the reason why Target stock is dropping because retailers all around the country stocks are dropping and 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 money spending is dropping because it's all going online. It's all cyber. I mean, I did all of my Christmas shopping minus two people online. That's and it pretty was good because you only buy for three. <laughs> I wish I have a I have an over the wall crew that I buy for <laughs> with with my brother and sister and all their kids. I have eight nieces and nephews to buy for and. Uh, 
Plus my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my steps, my girlfriend, my all these people. It's, it's expensive, and I'm not even a parent. <laughs> Forget about it. But, uh, yeah, Target reducing their sponsorship at, at, with Kyle Larson. Sounds like they're going to be spon- reducing their sponsorship with Chip Ganassi. Remember, they don't just sponsor Kyle Larson. They sponsor his IndyCar teams also. And they, they sponsor a lot of things out there for NASCAR, but they're going to be reducing their uh, commitment in 2017. Other than that, I mean, there's not a lot that's going on right now with the NASCAR world. I'm trying to thumb through here and seeing what's going on. But, yeah, that's about it. So, so let's take a break. We'll come back in turn number two. And we'll put the spotlight on Stuart Haas Racing. We'll be back here on the front stretch. Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaylee Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council Bluffs and online at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. We're hooked up in Turn two and still showing the green flag on the front stretch. Welcome back to the front stretch. Heading into turn number two. Brought to you by Quaker Steak and Lube and Council Bluffs. Tomorrow is the big day. They are closing out the new year by winging in 2017. All you can eat wings. 1095 starts tomorrow when the store opens at 11 a.m. And it ends Sunday New Year's Day when they close at 10 p.m. All you can eat wings all day long, all week long. Starting tomorrow, if you want to find me, I will be at Quaker Steak and Loop. Do they put a time limit on you? Like, I mean, if I go in at 11 o'clock in the morning to start watching football and I'm still there at 7 o'clock, is that just one plate? You know, <laughs> oddly enough, I've never found that out <laughs> for as much time as I spend well, there. Well, I don't think you could drink for eight hours. so <laughs> I'd, give be... it a, I'd give it a good shot, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> I would give it the old college try. I... <laughs> That's going on at Quaker Steak and Lube this week and this week only. Again, it starts tomorrow, goes through New Year's Day. Wing in the new year with Quaker Steak and Lube and the best wings in the Midwest. We're going to continue our spotlight of the teams throughout NASCAR. A couple of weeks ago, we did Hendrick Motorsports. Last week, we did Joe Gibbs Racing. Now let's talk about Stuart Haas Racing. 2016 was the final year for them at Chevy. We'll talk more about that as the story goes on. But let's start off with the four car of Kevin Harvick. Best of everybody else, Kevin finished, uh, excuse me, he was second best. Uh, Kurt Busch finished one position in front of him. Kevin finished eighth in the point standings. Four wins on the year, won the Phoenix Spring Race, the Bristol Night Race, New Hampshire, and the Fall Kansas Race. 17 top fives, two poles, and two DNFs. Average starting position of 11.7 worst uh, or average finishing position of 9.9 but at, but desperately needed to win the fall phoenix race and wasn't able to get it done nope. and really I'm, I'm trying to remember didn't really seem that strong at any I, time i don't think he race. let a lap no I, I i think he ran fifth through eighth yeah like most of the race i yep. think i think he had to start at the back for some reason didn't he did he have illegal body modification penalty uh, I don't remember if he was all the way at the back or just literally had a bad qualifying run and was starting. I was thinking he started like 19th or something okay, like that. That sounds about right. Uh, Kevin's contract is with the Stuart Haas Racing through 2019. Bush Beer is signed until that year. Jimmy John's Mobile One, Outback, and Ditech are all various 2017 2018 contracts, but are expected to re sign, especially Jimmy John's Mobile One and Outback. Now, Mobile One is a Stuart Haas racing sponsor. They they kind of spread the money throughout the four drivers, uh, all that love throughout that area. Uh, contract, again, expires in 2019, and as far as everyone knows, Rodney Childers is set to be with uh, Kevin for his duration at Stuart Haas Racing. Now, there was a lot of talk at the beginning of the season when uh, Stuart Haas Racing dropped the bombshell at Daytona that they were moving to Ford's that Kevin may not re-sign with Stuart Haas Racing and may want a way out of his contract. Kevin's always been a Chevy driver. He's been a bow tie man all of his life. But he quickly squashed those rumors and said he's excited to race the Blue Ovals in 2017 and beyond. Uh, so he was. Uh, he's. It sounds like he's going to be a Ford guy despite his allegiance with Chevy for a long for all of his career. Well, if he has any luck, you know, any luck at all in a Ford, he's not going to you know run away from him and right. And obviously, Stuart Haas's deal, they're not going to change for two years and then go back to Chevy. I yeah. mean, if they're going to make a change like this, it's going to be a legitimate shot and stay in it for several years. And we'll so. go ahead and talk about this now since it's kind of the last thing you talked about. The change to Ford, a lot of the industry experts, we talked to the 
we talked to Rick Allen and, and, and those guys at NBC and, um, and a couple of the industry insiders all felt like this was a move to, to be a little bit higher in the pecking order for a manufacturer. To be a flagship team. And this is the second year in a row that Chevy has lost a team that everyone says was rumored to be because of not feeling important. Furniture Racing left at the end of the 2015 season. Now Stuart Haas Racing is leaving at the end of the 2016 season. Chevy's starting to shrink their footprint quite a bit, which is less revenue in Rick Hendrick's pocket and in and, and Chevy's pocket. So it's you, you kind of wonder if maybe their, their britches grew a little bit too big for them. Well, I, I really doubt that. I just think that the Hendrick team was so powerful with so many titles. And then when, like, Harvick won his championship and Tony won his championship with the then form Stuart Haas Racing, which was running 90% of everything they had was coming from Hendrick Motorsports. Mm-hmm. So it was like three or four Hendrick satellite teams. So Hendrick's organization basically was eight teams. Yeah. And uh, drivers have egos, and so do owners. Yeah. So to be able to move over and get, you know, get paid by Ford – to possibly, you know, Roush is no longer the flagship team. I mean, mm-hmm. Ford's flagship team now is the Penske Group. Yeah. Um, but it's only two teams. Yeah. You know. And now, R- Roush Yates does supply for multiple teams. Uh, engines. Believe, right. Engines for those teams. And they run the Blue Ovals. But when you talk about a Stuart Haas Racing joining an organization, they're not going to drop to the bottom of the pecking order and no. work their way up. They're probably going to be the top team. The most important team since they have four cars. As opposed even though, to Penske's two. Right, exactly. And that's where a lot of the technical support is going to come from. I felt like this was a move for Stuart Haas Racing to step outside of that Hendrick shadow a lot. Right. Because when Tony won that championship, just like you said there, everyone said, well, it's Stuart Haas Racing, but it's a Hendrick satellite team. And I think that was fair because at that time, Darian Grubb was spending his Tuesdays over at Hendrick going through the data from the weekend and sitting in on the technical meetings. Well, and Darian Grubb came from Hendrick. And that's the reason why he came over was because he was able to bring that technical alliance with him and he was able to bring that that the the day-to-day operations of how things should go once that had played its course darian was gone and stewart haas racing started standing on its own and i think they still heard that a little bit when even when kevin harvick won his championship and so now they're saying we're not getting the love that we deserve these well, are our car- i mean because hendrick is sending out chassis to everybody but well, we're winning with them yeah and but i think hendrick was also saying okay that's two titles on our coattails <laughs> you know it's going to cost you next year yeah. because their contract was up at the end of this year correct so i do believe that probably played into the into the thing it might not have been the most important factor but it was in the back of tony's mind when they moved this year the 2016 season Stuart Haas Racing has been building their main their chassis all themselves. The only the only supplies they were getting for Hendrick was the engines, and that will now shift when they take over at Ford for Daytona 2017. Actually, they're they're moving all their Ford equipment in now and getting everything all set up for Daytona. They've been building their own chassis for the 2017 season for quite a while now, so they're all stocked and ready to go with their own internal chassis department. The 2016 results that they they saw. I think a chassis is the biggest component when it comes to being successful on the on the track because that, to me, is the spelling difference between Penske and Roush, well, your chassis and your setups. Um, oh, and setups, obviously, the biggest because the chassis, per NASCAR's you know, uh, tech <laughs> rule now with the laser station and everything, the chassis are all, there's very little difference. Yeah, remember Brad talked about those transformer chassis. Well, there's, there's mounting differences, yeah. you know, a little bit. But the actual chassis itself is pretty much the same. You, you've got variances in things like A frames, and you know, and then, and, but that I consider that all into setup. Yeah. You know, which A frame are you going to use at which track, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The actual chassis itself is pretty much, you know, it's almost like an IROC deal where they're mm-hmm. almost all the same. There's okay. very little difference. But again, the the way the chassis or the way the body's mounted can be different, and definitely the setup. Let's move on, move on to Danica Patrick. She is signed through 2018. She has Nature's Bakery, Aspen Dental, Tax Care, and Mobile One all set to be sponsors through the end of her contract. Not able to get a win yet this year. She remains winless in the Cup Series. Zero top five, zero poles, three DNFs. She has an average start of 25.1 with an average finish of 22. Considering all the team... All the drivers at Stuart Haas Racing, most of them have seen a three to four position gain on their on their the race finishes the from the average start to the average finish. She's right there. 
she continues to show sparks of improvements at certain tracks, but then she'll disappear for five or six races. Well, the three DNFs is kind of a neat hint. Um, I was reading an article the other day. I think I sent it to you um, about uh, the laps run mm -hmm. this year, the, the top ten. And Danica was like fourth or fifth yeah. in the total amount of laps run. And on her team, Kurt Busch was second in that list, yep. which was led by Casey Kane, of all people, when you think about uh, you know, supposedly the down year that Casey had, but he was on the track for more laps than any driver in the sport. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's something that uh, was looked at when he was, you know, when everybody re-signed and given him another shot. There's a lot of talented drivers out there, and I think a lot of NASCAR fans are over Danica. They're, she, we've talked about this for a little while, but I think more than anything, she's got to show measured improvement in 2017. And I think she has got to to get a couple of wins in 2018 if she hopes to get a contract renewal. Now, the one thing that is in her favor is merchandising. And if anybody just says, well, that's not fair. I hate to break it to you, but there was a lot of times that Dale Earnhardt Jr. would have been without a ride if it wasn't for his merchandising. He went through a four-year dry spell where a lot of drivers would have lost their ride. Well, but Rick stuck with him probably for more than just merchandising rights. But that money coming in helped a lot. Well, and look at this year. He was the most popular driver for the 14th time, and he ran half a season. Yeah. I it, mean, it, I don't like it in baseball when a first baseman plays three games and gets voted to the all-star team, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I, I don't like it when a driver wins the most popular driver only running half a year. Yeah. I, I don't think that's fair, but, you know, nobody called me. <laughs> <laughs> nobody asked you. <laughs> Uh, so that's Danica Patrick. Again, her contract is signed through the, 20, the end of the 2018 season. Tony Stewart retired at the end of this year. Clint Boyer set to take over that 14 car. Tony had one win on the season. And that was at Sonoma. He has five top fives, no poles, four DNFs this year, average start of 11.6, average finish of 16.1, four positions worse than when he started. That those The average race kind of spells his season. He has having a struggle of a year all year long. Yeah, yeah, he was. I mean, he had the one bright spot. Uh, you know, if you're uh, a Denny Hamlin fan, you say, oh, Denny pulled over and let him by. But no, Denny made a mistake. And uh, I don't think Tony was close enough when it would have come to the last turn. He'd have moved Hamlin to get that yeah. win. Yeah, so. and, and, uh, and I, th Hamlin said that's what he was doing. He was driving, Hamlin was driving in the rearview mirror expecting Tony to move him, but Tony wasn't there, and he overdrove the corner, and then Tony was able to just get right around him and then door him into the wall and, and, and get the win. But, yeah, that that is pretty much Tony's year, and that has been his year for the last couple of years. And I don't think it's so much of a, of a, a drop in talent as everything he's had going on outside the track. You a lot of distractions. You a lot of distractions. You injure your back at the beginning of this year and set out eight races. It's going to take a long time to get a feel back in the car and really to 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 reduce that pain on your back. A back injury is severe for anybody. I mean, that's that's one of the things that I pray to God I never have issues with is my back. Well, Jeff Gordon drug one on for a couple seasons, but yeah, I mean, you go to his off track stuff and his sprint car stuff that he you know went through. Yeah. Um, he also go through that he made it. He was very vocal about the fact that he wasn't happy when they downed the horsepower on mm -hmm. the cars and when they kept making the arrow changes. This far into his career, um, he was just having trouble adapting to the new cars. Absolutely. The, uh, the road course, the horsepower obviously makes a difference, but a road course isn't an arrow course, so yeah. that's that's not that big a deal there. But anywhere else, I mean, he never showed anything. Yeah. You know. You know, he would have, I guess, uh, to, to concentrate, he would have sparks here and there where you would look through the lineup to go, oh, look, top five finish. Good for Tony. He, he got himself top five finish, and then the next week it'd be the 30th place finish. Yeah. So he would follow it up with a rough day. And I don't think anybody blames him. Had any of that off off track stuff not happened, had he not broke his leg, had he not been in the incident with Kevin Ward, and Kevin lost his life tragically, and had he not broke his back, I think he, we'd still be talking about Tony coming back in 2017 and probably for a couple more seasons. I think he would have continued, but that's just one of those th – th those three things happening, just they'll wear a guy out. And I think he was ready to give up the day-to-day the -day monotony of, of the, the Cup Series. It's no fun. I mean, it's tough enough to be a part of the Sprint Cup Series and to, to be at the racetrack so much and to commit so much of your life. And if you're not finishing that great and you're not driving that great and, and you don't like it, then you walk away. Well, and he's never had a spot like this in his career before. Yeah. He's never been, you know, a 20th place car or whatever. Just never has been. Yeah. You know. 
Final car, the 41 of Kurt Busch, signed through the end of 2017. Monster Energy, Haas Automation, State Water Heaters, and again, Mobile One all sponsor the 41 during the 2016 season. NASCAR and Monster announced that despite the cooperation, the uh, the new sponsorship between the two, they would not be reducing their commitment with any of their drivers. So we expect Monster Energy to return to Kurt Busch on that 41 car. His year, his season on the year, he had one win at Pocono. That he had one win that came at Pocono. Nine top fives, two poles, two DNFs. Average start of 12.1. Average finish of 12.0. He increased it by a tenth. Oh, pretty consistent. Uh, finished seventh in the point standings. None of the uh, Stuart Haas racing cars made it to the championship round. Harvick was eliminated after the round of eight. Stewart was eliminated after the round of 16. Kurt Busch was also eliminated round of eight. Thank you. I forgot about that part of it. I thought only two of them made it in. Uh, but Kurt did make it through into the round of eight. You're absolutely right. Uh, again, we, we kind of talked a little bit on Stuart Haas racing making the switch to Fords in 2017. Giving an as uneducated guess as you and I can give because we're in Omaha, Nebraska. We're not we're not in the heart of NASCAR. Do you expect a downtick, draw even, or uptick from Stuart Haas Racing in 2017 with switching to Fords? Um, I expect them to pretty much go about what they did this year. Um, obviously, the Boyer change is going to be a big change. That's to me, that's bigger than the Ford deal. In all honesty, I still think that Harvick and Kurt Busch will probably make the chase. I mean, you get 16 drivers in there. I don't know if Boyer will because I don't know if he'll win a race. Tony wouldn't have been in if he hadn't won a race. Right. And um, who knows with Danica, like you said, there's a spark here and there. She could get lucky. I mean, it's been proven year in, year after year after year. Anybody can win. Chris Buescher won a race last year. Yeah. So Danica can win a race. Can she race to a win? I don't think so yet. But can she win a race? Yes, she could. Because um, Chris Busher barely made the top 30 in points, but he still won that race on a fuel right. deal with the rain. So right. who knows what could happen there. But I think you know, they'll have a couple cars in the chase. I don't know if it'll be three because I don't know if Boyer will make it in there. But I definitely think uh, Kevin and Kurt will both be back in the chase. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't think the body change is going to be that big a deal for these guys because yeah. that's all that's changing. I agree. I think the big change and the big uptick will come with Clint Boyer coming over. I mean, all he's got to do is just finish – more consistently than Tony did. I think Tony finished Richmond in the 24th position. So he qualified with that win and being in the top 30, I think it was 24th. It might have been 25th or 26th, but he made it in safely. He, he wasn't in risk when going into Richmond of, of not making it into the chase because of the points. I think Boyer will have a better season. It's just a lot happened to Boyer this year, and I think just the the harsh reality of going to an underfunded uh, organization like Tommy Baldwin Racing. Excuse me, not Tommy Baldwin. Uh, he was with... Uh, H. Scott Motorsports. H. Scott, correct. Uh, I think that reignited the fire for him. He had to suffer all year from the back of the field and have nothing to come forward with. So I think once he gets down into that car at Daytona, I think he's going to have a lot of, of push, a lot of drive behind him that he didn't have last year. He kind of recharged, and he was like, he's like, okay... I got to prove that I can do this. Well, I I definitely think any car out of Stuart Haas stables a top you know a top sixteen car can mm -hmm. make the chase. Any one of those three cars. Yeah. But it's will they, and that's where the driver comes in. Um, who knows how much of this carryover for the fallout that that Clint's had basically the last two years, where he's kind of dropped out of the scene. You yeah. know, um, how much of an effect that's going to have on him? Is he going to be able to get back to where he can run and feel the pressure and be in the top five and run all day? Mm -hmm. You know, he's a young guy, so, you know, I, I think he should be able to, to come back and bounce back and be able to do that. But he's also, you know, got distractions with kids and stuff now that he didn't have 10 years ago, and it'll be anybody's guess. But he'll have the equipment to run up there. It'll be interesting nonetheless. Stuart Haas Racing 2016 review and preview for 2017. We're going to sit down with Scott Bloomquist, driver of the Zero Lucas Oil Late Model Series uh, dirt late model car throughout uh, the United States. We'll talk to him about his a little bit about his career, but we're going to talk a lot about this year and winning the Lucas Oil Championship as a part of the Legends of the Dirt Series. We'll be back here on the front stretch. 
There is no such thing as an off-season at Joe's Carding. No matter how cold it is outside or how much snow is on the ground, you'll always be warm and dry inside at Joe's Carding, the Metro's largest indoor carding track. Located in Council Bluffs on 23rd Avenue next to AMC Theater. Find Joe's Carding on Facebook or head to joescarding.com for hours, pricing, and a schedule of booked parties. That's joescarding.com. Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's Carding today and find out what all your friends already know. Quaker Steak and Lube is helping you end the holiday season with a bucket of cash. Stop in before New Year's Eve, purchase a $25 gift card, and receive a scratch card. You could take home $10,000, wings for a year, or other great prizes. Stop in today, and while you're enjoying all-you-can-eat wings on Tuesday or their weekday happy hour from 4 to 6, make sure you grab a $25 gift card and a scratch ticket for your chance to win $10,000. Get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Mid-America Drive, Council Bluffs. Feather the brake and get back to the gas. Dan and Dirk are headed into turn three on the front stretch. Welcome back to the front stretch, heading into turn number three, and it's time to kick off this weekend's Legends of the Dirt Series. We've had him on before, but son of a gun, he won't quit winning in championships at that, so we thought he's going to be our first two-time interview with the Legends of the Dirt Series. Scott Bloomquist joining us. How you doing, Scott? Good, how are you doing? doing pretty good uh, you're having a good time uh ending out the season with a lucas oil late model championship and then winning over at the um the gateway dirt nationals getting that twenty thousand dollars to win yeah you know it's always nice to win the last one uh you know unless somebody's gonna have one between now and the end of the year as far as big shows that was it so uh yeah it was nice to go out there and yeah, that racetrack was nobody expected quite as much out of us as what they saw but you know the track game is small that's probably the smallest racetrack i've ever been on <laughs> To go in there and we, we really had to hustle and I think some of the photos that people could see from the race and the footage that you know, it was it got a little bit rough and I just had to uh sit up in the seat and get it on. <laughs> had to go do some work for a little bit. I actually had to work for a little bit. <laughs> it didn't that look like everything I saw on video, it didn't look like you got much time to rest on any one lap, that's for sure. Well, I tell people you really need time to think. You know, I mean, it's just, it was as soon as you got in the gas, it was time to get out. And it's just, it, normally, you've got time to think a little bit, but it was more just uh, just reaction and more than thought. Uh, we'll, we'll kick it off by talking about that Gateway Dirt Nationals. Was it frustrating for you when you started off that feature and there was those five or six cautions that came out and you guys weren't able to complete many laps? It's like you you get all excited coming off turn four, you're ready to go race, and then there's the caution again. Well, it, it wasn't as frustrating as having Shannon Babb under me on the, on the start. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, it's like, okay, let's st- stop the press, regroup, and uh, try this again. You know, but, uh, you know, not really. I mean, I you know, I knew, you know, it took quite a bit to just drive by somebody, you know, unless they made a mistake, you know. So I knew if I didn't make a bad mistake. I still could, could maneuver the car and make it difficult to be able to execute a pass. You know, and early, you know, that fish Shannon was, was good, and he was a little bit underneath, lower than we were. I thought I was low, but he was lower. You know, we just adjusted our line each time. And, uh, you know, then Don, you know, he ended up running pretty good. He, he settled down and, and eased in the corner a little bit better than we did. Uh, you know, got himself in position to at least be there and make it exciting. But I think that we had a... a uh, I don't know if we had a little older tire on the right rear or something, but later in the race, longer the race went, you know, we just seemed to be able to get away a little bit and uh, and command the race. Talk about that track layout. I was kind of watching the Dirt on Dirt broadcast, and I thought, you know, next year they may be able to widen that track out just a little bit. They they probably have about five five or six feet that they could uh, widen the corners out. Is that something you would favor, or do you like the way the track was laid out this year? Oh, actually, when I pulled, when we rolled into the place and I looked at it, I was like, oh, I thought it was going to be just terrible. Uh, but the dirt itself made for for good racing because you know you could beat up the line that everyone that they ran the most got beat up and and slowed down, which made people be able to go to the outside and move around the racetrack. So that was the key to to the weekend, I think. And you know, we I discussed with Kevin and with. Uh, Cody, you know, just all that, that that we're working the racetrack and the you know, involvement in the shape of it, stuff that you, they had a lot of room left down on the floor, you know, for for cars to line up, 
And you know, in the corners on the corner side of things, there was you know, two and a half car width, maybe a little more than that. That they could use some of that up. I uh, got it where you know they just had a car and a half drive around the racetrack on the outside of it. Uh, you know, for staging, mm-hmm. it'd be about all the guy needed in the corners, and then maybe you know they it was you know, five cars, six cars wide, and uh, on the straightaways they could have taken that down to you know they only had two, two and a half, three at the most. You know, car width to, for staging and stuff. So. I think that adding a little bit more and keeping the straightaways a little farther apart would make the track speed a little bit better uh, and and be able to make it where you could stay too wide, you know, around the whole racetrack. Okay. Well, obviously, with the first year, they're going to run. You know, they're going to figure out a few bugs and a few changes that if they, yeah. well, they, uh, they if they keep great. it going. Yeah, I was I was very impressed. You know, for the first year and to get in there and not really know what to expect out of the dirt, not know what to, uh, to expect out of anything really. I mean, it, it was I didn't know what to expect, so it, it was a first for me. But again, I can't say enough for for Kevin and Tammy in the uh, series that you know doing the job they did, keep things organized and. And Cody, you know, taking the gamble and putting the thing on, I think, I think it's something that's going to continue on for a long time. With what happened on Friday night, you losing the lead late in that race with just a few to go. At what point in time during Saturday night's feature did you feel the most confident you were going to win it? Uh, when I drew the number one. I was wondering because you looked <laughs> – when you drew that, I went, oh, there we go, that Scott was, uh, won. That was, uh, yeah, that, was, that was pretty really. I mean, it too, to do that both times. And I guess the modified driver, I uh, pulled number one both times, someone told me so. Yeah, but that's very rare, very odd. I mean, I, I normally don't have near that kind of luck drawing uh, for starts. And, and when that happened, it's like, well, it's your race to lose now. Yeah. You know, so, uh, but again, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And traffic could play a big part, you know, Friday night. We just got boxing in traffic and I moved outside. I just, I just caught the, a little bit of a rut wrong and it made my car go into a push. I had to stop. It's just killing my momentum. And and putting everyone else in position to have a good race for the win, and we we you know, I, I messed around with people saying, ah, I just did that for for the hell of it, just to make it look good, you know. But no, nah, we, <laughs> yeah. we 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 uh, I, I would like to win that one too, though. Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything out there that that it, you could say a driver would just give up and let him have yeah. someone else. Have. I, I haven't seen <laughs> that race yet. Not. <laughs> Absolutely. Not. That's so I said. I've, had, I've had drivers that have cars of mine and would be you know be at a big show and. And they'd be like, well, you could have given me a little bit there. And I'm like, I don't give nothing to nobody on the racetrack. <laughs> yeah. You got to earn it. If you, are, if, you, if, you, if you earn it, I had thought you said, I ain't giving up nothing. Well, we've got that local SLMR series up here, and they pay a couple extra, a couple hundred bucks extra to run second. And I haven't seen anybody <laughs> lift yet. <laughs> you know? No. no. Lift, uh, yeah, run second, go back to your truck, not have anybody give a damn about you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> <Do> that. <laughs> That's what we're really surprised about because I thought, you know, maybe somebody would, would take a couple extra hundred bucks. You know, local touring series, a couple extra hundred bucks in the paychecks a, is a big payday, but nobody wants to take that couple extra hundred bucks. They all want the trophy. Yeah, no, it's, that's where pride sits in. I don't think anybody, I think, you know, now if somebody paid, if paid 20 grand to win and uh, 100 for second, I think you might see well, yeah. shit happen. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that race yet either. <laughs> well, no, but if you did, you think it'd pile up for second. <laughs> yeah, but now we'd see some fighting going on. Yeah. I got I a real, be, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you, I'm sure you got a lot of comments on this or you have in your history, in your career, but when you drew that one pill, and then, you know, the Boo Birds came out because everyone knew you were going to be the hardest guy to get around. When you came out for driver introductions, I think you showed the fans that boo all you want to. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's when usually <laughs> the louder they boo, the more you want to just say back at you. <laughs> that doesn't ever get to you, though, when, when it's just like, you know what, guys, nah. I've, I've done so much for the sport. I've I've entertained you. You know, you kind of feel like the gladiator out there in the in the arena. Are you not entertained? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they'd all feel pretty empty if we weren't there. So, you know, I know that, too. And it's like, I think the, the, the biggest thing I could say is uh, the only the only sound that would really bother me on introductions that would really get to me would be silence. Hmm. So all the booze and the you know the mixtures and the booze and the 
you know, they, you know, I heard another driver say a long time ago, I must, I must be making money. They're booing. <laughs> That's, Kyle Bush used to say that as long as they're making noise, I don't care if they're cheering or booing, just make some noise yeah, for me. Exactly. You know, but I mean, that's their, the, and one thing I can say, you know, we see a difference in different areas we travel. And anytime we go to an area that there's been a lot of successful drivers, you know, real successful drivers from that particular area. And they've acquired a big following of fans, local fans. Uh, you know, that's where we hear the loudest booze. And they're, they're, they're just pulling for their, uh, for the driver that they grew up watching race, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I understand all that, but I think down deep, they, they still have a passion to get to see us race against them. A couple yeah. of final questions on the, uh, the gateway dirt nationals. Um, you raced your modified in that too. How, how did that go for you? Did you enjoy racing that? Well, we actually we weren't ready. We really weren't prepared with that. We were finishing the body up at the track there, and uh, and didn't have any spare things and springs and things to change, and and went out and the you know just a little bit too soft on the front, and the chassis was up hitting the ground so hard I couldn't steer it in the heat race. It just so I, I just pulled the plug. I said, later, you know, I'm not gonna do a half-ass effort on anything in life and have it, especially if it takes away from the real goal that we came there to accomplish was to win a late model race. And mm-hmm. I said, we're parking this thing. We're going to focus on winning this late model race. And, and uh, that's what we did. Jimmy Owens has said in the past that if modifieds were able to pay a little bit better, he'd probably go race them full time. Is that kind of your sentiment too? Or are you, well, I mean, I can say, you know, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed the modified races I've run. I've only run you know, a couple of them. And uh, it's, it's, the cars are definitely enjoyable to race. They're surprisingly very comparable, you know, as far as the horsepower to traction ratio to you know, how they handle it. I, I think it's a great class. Anybody that wants to go late model racing, I think it's a great class to start in and you know, work your way up because you've got plenty of horsepower to spin the tires. And, and so many of the same things apply with chassis, you know, uh, setups and things we can do. Uh, I do enjoy it. I'm sure, you know, there's supposed to be some bigger shows this year uh, for mods, and I, I'd say we'll probably end up running a little bit more of that. Kind of chasing those paydays, too? Yeah, just, you know, we like the big paydays, obviously. Those are yeah. the ones you really can consider to be made money. Uh, you know, it's 10000 to win, clicking them off and running them down the road. Uh, you know, you, you, you've got to knock off some some stuff, you know, thirty to 50000 to win and above stuff to, to ever really put that in a plus column that you can actually put, say you've made money. Yep. Uh, the others just keep, this, keep the ball rolling. Something that I noticed um, with this Gateway Nationals, with the indoor race, that made me think of you right off the bat from when we've t- spoken with you before is the way they had the, uh, I don't, I'm going to say the first, 12 or 15 rows in the stands all covered with tarp you know Mm -hmm. so they didn't have the fans getting beat up with the dirt because that was one thing you mentioned before about putting up a big plexiglass screen or something to keep the dirt from the fans did they Mm -hmm. talk to you about that or was that just something that kevin had thought up and did by himself i think they probably were just aware of that we didn't discuss it but you know just they they had so many uh temporary or or seating that normally goes out into that section that they needed to get covered up probably so they didn't have such that's a cleanup, but you know, my, my goal, my vision was, uh, when I go in there, it's like, you know, you guys are missing the boat. You need to cover up the next level of seat. Just take them out and cover them with dirt, make a four chance. <laughs> I thank God there's some bitch with all have <laughs> uh, You want to talk about getting dirt out of your damn man? Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Uh, one last question about the the modifieds. Did you enjoy running with them, or would you prefer to see that as a late model only race next year? Well, there, I, I talked to talked to them about that, and they said that it possibly may be a late model only race next year. I think that not to to you know I'm not big on two mile homer in any fashion, but I think that that's going out there and winning that race put a little bit of a stamp on it uh, as being a brief pretty winning and you know and the purse is you know paying what they did to win was also a plus but I mean just it I think it makes it to where some people wanna you know some some other top drivers I think will want to go next year and try to get on that list of winners. And it's probably easier on the track too. I mean for the fans we always like to see as many classes as possible but for the track and the track preppers they like to see as few classes on the track as possible because it's easier to manage the cr- track. Well, they don't like the skinny tires. I know that. Yeah, that, that, that was a concern. I know. You know, the uh, 
and they they played that pretty good as far as the timing of, of who went on the racetrack first and trying to keep it from rutting up too much. So, but again, I had off to all of them. I think they did a great job and uh, to go in there and that dirt that, that I know Kevin was unfamiliar with and uh, and to to come out of there with there was racing that went on in that show. Or, you know, I, I went out and started watching just watching some of the heat races and. And I'm going to see some three wide stuff on the straightaway. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, it was really, I don't think anyone expected the kind of racing that they saw, uh, you know, on that small of the the track. And again, that was the smallest racetrack I've ever raced on. So uh, it it surprised me. And I, and and I was entertained and that's not easily done sometimes. (laughs) You look, I saw some, uh, some stuff on Facebook, um, good old social media, of you buzzing around on your little scooter down there, I think they, they should wouldn't have... let us have our four wheelers. I, I, you know, they can't walk it. Well, yeah. you, did you re- where? They, they should have had you guys line up on those scooters and run a few laps. That could have been entertaining. <laughs> yeah, well, so, yeah, let me see. We decided to do that. We'll have to kid a hot scooter. <laughs> where, where was that picture taken? There's a picture of you at some fast food restaurant on your scooter. You must have driven it through the door. Probably oh, concession no, stand. Probably concession stand. stand. Oh, yeah, I went up to the top grand oh, okay. right down the hallways <laughs> and pulled into the concession stand. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be kind of fun. Did you wear your helmet while you were going? No, you didn't have a helmet. Well, no, I, you know, I, was, I kept on waiting on one of the guards or one of the people, the security people there to stop me. Nobody did. So Nobody says no know. to the zero. <laughs> well, I don't know. If they, they, that's one thing. I don't think they knew anything about who I was or there's no special treatment there. I think they each didn't know what to do. <laughs> I think that driver said, I'm so on fast. They didn't know what to say. Yeah, they couldn't catch you. There you go. <laughs> you didn't run anybody over, did you? No. Good. Good, good. Not that I'll admit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll wrap the show up. We'll wrap up the final conversations with your 2016 Lucas Oil Late Model Series Championship uh, with Scott Bloomquist. We'll be back here on the front stretch. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows. It's checkers or wreckers as we enter turn four. On the front stretch, presented by Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs. Welcome back to the front stretch. Just about ready to wrap this up. We're talking with the 2016 Lucas Oil Late Model Series champion. His third championship title with the Lucas Oil Late Model Series. The driver, the number zero. That's Scott Bloomquist. Scott, uh, 2016, you talked about it when we talked to you back in May, just before the Go 50. You said you really wanted to come out in 2015 and win the championship. And Jonathan Davenport just had too good of a year to be able to overcome, plus some rainouts really kind of hindered your ability. You came out and blew the field away this year. 15 wins in 47 races. Is that the kind of year you were, you expect every year, or was this above board? No, I mean, we, I really do expect that every year. And, and this year, you know, we had a uh, number of events that we were late getting there that cost us the, the entire night. And, you know, we, we just, uh, I know we can do better. So it's just a matter of, you know, the rest of them are going to have to step it up and, and we're going to be ready to, to hit it hard again next year and go after it again. But, you know, there, there's definitely a tremendous amount of races that we could have uh, increased our, our finish, with, you know, percentage of ratio and, and it's got behind. And that's one thing. It's hard to, to get enough help or have enough help uh, to, to be as prepared as you need to be anymore for the traveling and chasing the series hard to afford the kind of help it takes uh, but the biggest thing is hard to even find the kind of help you need to do it it's just such a unusual uh, job and, and hours and uh, and expectations there's just nothing like it and you better really love it you say and you showing up late to a couple of events that, that actually kind of surprises me because every time I've been at a racetrack that you're at it always seems like your crew and you are the most buttoned up of anybody. You you guys always have the car as pristine as possible, well before anybody else, cleaned up, up on jack stands, covered up, ready to go. And that's kind of surprising you guys uh, fell behind like that. Yeah, it's just, you know, because I'm not going to leave the shop unless I'm ready to, 
I am sure that I've got what it takes to win the race and we're prepared to level to win the race. And, and if we, you know, just trying to get, especially on some of these deals where we're going to be gone for two or three days and run multiple races or four or five days, or even not stay out the entire week, uh, keep on racing to, we get some equipment that we've been working with in the shop. that's time consuming and, and trying to educate myself more on, on cars and things that are going on with the cars and, and let that take more time of the week than what I needed to. Uh, then, it, you know, get to the end of the week and we still got all the general work and maintenance and, and things to do to get ready to go race again and burnt the most of the week up on, uh, say, a pull down rig and, and, you know, doing, trying to educate myself deeper on chassis things. And, and just now I've got a little better handle on it and know the amount of time that I can put towards that. And, and I readjusted our schedule. Just said, okay, now we're not doing any of that stuff until the cars are ready to load. And then if there's time to you know, spend time educating ourselves on, on suspension stuff, we will. But uh, this this winter, hopefully we'll get to do some more of the things we'd like to done all, all year. We didn't get to test there as much this year, but it, it still didn't kill us. We mm-hmm. we did enough testing in the spring. Uh, and and when we were in Florida, we stayed down there and tested a little bit and just found a couple of things that were, seemed to be pretty beneficial that helped carry us through the year. But everybody's working hard, and we're going to have to be sure. You know, we can't just assume that we're good enough. Uh, the deal is you can't sleep. Somebody's staying up all night thinking and working, and uh, you might have an edge today, but it might be gone tomorrow. Was it more satisfying for you? Uh, winning your third title, or was the did you get more satisfaction out of dethroning the past champion? I think it might have been a combination of both. You know, we I again don't want to stand in the two mounts torn again. I ain't really saying this kind of stuff. I, I know that you get one year wonders in every sport, and uh, it, it really to me only means something if you can come back and back it up and then back it up five years from now and 10 years from now. It's like, you know what you did yesterday? Okay, that's that's something. But can you do it tomorrow? And can you do it your whole career? Well, it's definitely... You a- really know what you, what you put, uh, put together. Do you know what it took to win or just fall into something and, and have a uh, uh, one year of what appeared to be greatness? And I guess you can't come back and back it up. People forget so fast, and that's one thing I've learned. You know, I mean, I've heard anybody bring up Brian Burkhoffer's name in a long time. No matter what he did, they forget so fast. So <laughs> that's why we just got to work as hard for tomorrow and uh, the next race. And, and people only care about your last performance, you yeah. know, and the next one coming up. Uh, what you did last year is up a bit. Yeah, it's definitely a what have you done lately for me sport. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about uh, the the talent in the Lucas Oil Series, and it's going to get even more stacked next year with the announcement that Josh Richards, who is the winningest driver in the world of Outlaw Late Model Series, is going to be joining the Lucas Oil Series. Do you welcome the competition, or is it more of, yeah, you can try and come play with us? Well, it, it's it's going to bring a little more attention, which I know is a positive. Um, and sure, you know, I'm going to um, think... I always I like I'd like to run uh, some equivalent to the Knoxville Nationals under the you know the biggest events of the year every weekend. I, I like all the competition being there. I yeah. mean, it just makes me on my game even better. So, you know, bring more heat to the uh, to the table. It just gives me the inspiration that I think I need to rise to that level again. The last thing I want to cover before we wrap up today's uh, interview in the Legends of the Dirt series, I, I want to talk about the t- tire deal at Eldora because I don't think that you drivers that were accused got enough of a voice to outshout those screaming cheaters. So from your side of, of, of what happened, take us through the process uh, uh, from from being notified to the appeals process and, and to the, uh, the, the eventual lawsuit, if you could. Well, I mean, I think the latest thing that we used about it uh, what was released by, I think, the outlaws or by dirt organization is that the, the thing's been dropped. Now, that's the farthest from the truth. It's just been moved to North Carolina, and, uh, you know, none of us are interested in dropping any of it. 
uh, we all feel the same way. We know that it was unjust. It was uh, not accurate or done properly. Uh, we feel that it's, it's time to have there be some case law established as to what these series is and, and racetracks and, you know, can, can get by with. And, and we're all adamant about it, going to court and, and following through with it to, uh, and so that we don't have it anymore. You know, it's just too many, too many judgment calls, too many things that can go wrong. And in and, and, and that testing procedures, you, you just, you can't, you really shouldn't be able to. It's as big of an effect on people's lives as what they do with as little uh, backbone and, uh, and procedures that are used to ensure that the series is right. And, and even the lab, you know, to, to have the ability to double check the lab. We all know this world is made of uh, mistakes. And, you know, to, to know that the lab had some new equipment there and and to have a dream happen across the country that were wrong and thrown out of races for what ended up being what we were all thrown out for, which was same things are missing or not added to our tire and not being able to tell us what was missing and not be able to understand from the moment a race tire gets track and goes through multiple temperatures and things dissipate and dry out and the molecular structure of the tire is changing constantly from the moment it comes out of the mold so just it's it's just need we just are ready to uh, take this as far as it, it takes to to establish how things must be done before you can and cannot possibly have an effect on someone's entire career. I mean, some of the young drivers, it, it can change their life. I mean, it, I, it I could make, dramatically you know, affect their sponsorship of, ability. Well, I make a joke of it. I said, well, I've already done, done enough damage to my career my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for damage much more, but I said, I'm, I've learned a lot from it, and I know that, you know, people are going to still talk and say things that have to do with me, uh, true or false, but young, younger guys, that they're not ready for that kind of heat, and and don't know how to respond or act to ridicule and to uh, the pressures of being accused of things, that, and when, you, when you're there and you just know, absolutely know that you didn't do anything to your tires. I mean, you know, they tested 14, 46 or 14, which is about half. Checked the same, which they claim nothing added, just something wasn't present. Uh, so almost half were all the same, and the other half all over here. You know, who knows which one really is right. And uh, all I know is I know there's nothing happens in my building that I don't know about, and there's nothing going to be put on a tire or done to the tire that I don't know about. No spot on, which makes me the rest in that we all had the same thing, which they still won't tell us what it was. So we're just going to have to go through the motions, and uh, I think we're all dedicated to do that. The changes that Lucas Oil applied to the series regarding your guys' tire distribution, are you? do you like that change to the sport, or is it now a big inconvenience? Uh, I mean, even if it's an inconvenience, I think last year, you know, what they did at Florence uh, showed it didn't make any difference. You know, it doesn't really make any difference to, I think, most of the competitors just want everything to go smooth and to just hopefully be there and know and maybe even get your money. So you have to sit there and have them hold it and wait on test uh, or lab results come back. And, yeah, but, but whatever it takes, I think that. And all the drivers, or whatever it takes, because none of us want someone to be getting from by that is an unfair advantage. And, you know, Tony Stewart stole it from me as far as I'm concerned, because I, in our meetings, sort of have stated that it's the same as stealing to me. You know, I don't feel, I wouldn't feel good about winning races that by using things that I knew were illegal uh, and an unfair advantage, it's, it's as close to stealing as it gets. Yeah. So I, I've got too much pride and, and have accomplished too much in my career. Uh, and I've always told everyone that's come through my building, it's a customer or just a racer, that until you can get 100% out of your equipment by the book, you don't even need to think about cheating. And if you can get 100% out of your equipment and go by the rule book, you might win 
all of them. Wow. And nobody's getting 100%. Hmm. That's an interesting way of putting it. I never thought about it that way. So just work on the things that are within the rules and tr- work hard enough and get 100% out of what is legal and you'll win them all. going to leave it on that note. I think you said it all, Scott. We do appreciate your time. It's been a great time talking to you as always. We'll, uh, we'll hit you up again in May as we get ready for the Go 50 at IAD Speedway. Sounds good. Have a good holiday season. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Good luck in 2017. Be good. Thanks. I always do love talking to Scott. Yes, it's because I have a man crush, but I, I always learn something from Scott. Well, he doesn't hold anything back. He tells us. He's got such an interesting way of taking uh, of put, uh, putting it that way. You think that I always thought, well, if I'm not winning, i got to be cheating then. So then I can win. But he just put it absolutely exactly right. If you're not getting 100% out of your equipment, there's no need to cheat. Because you could be doing it legally if you were doing it better. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fascinating way of thinking about it. We do appreciate everybody joining us for the final show of 2016. We'll be back next Sunday for New Year's Day, and we will do it all again. NASCAR news and notes. We'll take another look at a NASCAR Sprint Cup team and the drivers that are under their banner. And don't forget, this week is All You Can Eat Wings or Quaker Steak and Lube. While you're over in the area, you might as well stop by Joe's Karting and do a little indoor karting. For, jo- for, for Dirk Houston, I am Dan Taylor. This has been the Front Stretch on AM590, Omaha's ESPN Radio. The official watering hole of the Front Stretch has you covered any day of the week with the best wings, great burgers, and amazing steaks. Each weekday from 4 to 6 is Happy Hour, featuring dollar off draft and well drinks plus $4 Luberitas. Mondays are Kids Night. Tuesdays are All You Can Eat Wings for $12.95. And the Lube even delivers to the Council Bluffs area. Like Quaker Steak and Lube Council Bluffs on Facebook for a full list of weekly events. Get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Mid America Drive, Council Bluffs. Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs is the high-octane excitement you've been looking for. It's the Metro's largest indoor track with eco-friendly, low-emission engines. You can enjoy fast-paced road course racing just across the river at Joe's Carding. Located near Bass Pro in the Mid-America Center on 23rd Avenue and online at joescarding.com. That's carding with a K. Open Monday to Thursday, 2 to 10, Fridays until 11, Saturdays 11 to 11, and Sundays noon to 8. This has been the Front Stretch Radio Show, presented by Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs. To contact Dan or Dirk, find them on Facebook at The Front Stretch or email them at frontstretch590 at gmail.com. If you missed any part of today's show or want to hear a previous show, subscribe to the Joe's Carding YouTube page where you can find almost every Front Stretch show. 